So good morning to you all. That was an amazing panel. Super excited to be able to follow up and have this conversation with our guests on stage. I'll start with an introduction of myself. I will briefly introduce the panelists and then I'll let you, I'll let them tell you a little bit more about themselves and the spaces that they're occupying here today. My name is Cecilia Vaughn Guy. I am a health fellow in Rep. Robin Kelly's office. Um, I am super excited to be on this panel today as we talk about clinical trial diversity for a number of reasons. But one of the most important reasons is that Rep. Kelly will be introducing or um, reintroducing legislation around clinical trial diversity um, in the first phases. The NIH Clinical Trial Diversity Bill is an opportunity for us to look at implementing diversity initiatives on the ground floor, where we right now have this opportunity with the, through the DEPICT Act to have that happen in the third and fourth phases of clinical trials in the FDA space. So super excited to be here today. Super excited to talk to some very important stakeholders and helping with that work. And I'll introduce everyone down the panel this way. Um, so I'll start with um, Megan McKenzie from um, Gentech. If you don't mind just telling the room a bit about yourself and the initiatives that you all have going on. Thank you. And thank you everyone for having me here today. I'm so honored to be here. It's such a lively audience. I was here last year and. Um, it's very intimidating. All of you, I am learning so much. Um, I'm with Genentech, the Chief Diversity Office in Patient Inclusion and Health Equity, and I've been in research for 25 years, been very lucky to be part of trials that sometimes work, and there's nothing like seeing tumors melt on a scan in an oncology patient and wanting every eligible patient to have the first right of refusal to that trial. And we know patients are not being asked, in particular black and brown communities, they may not have access to specialty physicians, but even referring physicians, making assumptions that someone doesn't want to participate or that uh, a, a compliance assumption, which is false. So it's really important to me to bring education and clinical trials and patient support and ensure that every eligible patient is asked. And just a minute for our company, I report to Cleta Highsmith, who reports to our CEO and the Chief Diversity Office. We have three pillars that all 150 officers sign action plans to and that's foster belonging for our people, where we have uh, commitments to double black and Latino representation and our leadership levels to the C-suite, as well as Asian representation. And we mandate unconscious bias training and inclusive hiring for anyone who's interviewing anyone at Genentech. As well, we have our advanced inclusive research and health equity pillar, which is what I'm most um, involved in, working with sites and experts that have much more knowledge than we do to try to improve representation in clinical trials. And I'll go a little bit further in that when we, we have examples, um, but working with sites and patients who uh, can tell us the brutal truth of what we're doing wrong and how to be better. And then our Transform Society pillar is transforming community and working with our community. So for example, our, our giving group is very proud that last year we gave 26 million to grants and programs, and 94% of those grantees were leaders of color or co-leaders of color. So being very, our, our speaker in the beginning said being intentional, being very intentional about uh, writing past wrongs, looking at systemic inequities, and even our diversity supplier goals of spending up to 1 billion by 2025 for diverse suppliers. So really believing that DNI is everybody's business and everywhere we are inside and outside of our work, bringing that to the table. So thank you again for, for having me here. Thank you. It is so important to be able to have that work in all spaces of the business because it does help with buy-in just everywhere. Um, next we have Dr. Russo, um, Dr. Leo Russo from Pfizer. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And my, I'm, my name is Leo Russo. I'm an epidemiologist by training. And it's probably going back to three to four years where I became really aware and passionate about these, these issues of clinical trial diversity, health, health equity, disease disparity. And so what I really have done is make sure that my group, we've pivoted towards leaning into that kind of research. And we because as everybody knows here, they're integrally related. And I think as Gary put it, disease disparity, we're past the point of describing, we're past the point of identifying. So we are doing studies now where we look for drivers, causes, and how can we get the, the, the large le bunch of levers that my company Pfizer has to do action, action in, in quality improvement. Um, one of the things though is that we've, um, we've learned that it's really, it's about disease epidemiology and you need to have Goals, you need to make parts of this objective. It needs to be that if a, our company needs to diversify its clinical trials, it needs to have targets and goals that it meets. And so what my group does is we, we look at diseases and we set those goals. And we 
set them objectively so that there's no questions about them and that it's something that the company strives for. And I've seen an amazing transformation at Pfizer. Pfizer's always been, I think, for quite a while uh, aware of clinical trial diversity and the needs, but really in the last few years, ever since our experience with the COVID-19 vaccine trials, it's gone from really a being a good corporate citizen to really essential to the business, essential to how we do business. So I'm, again, I'm very happy to be here. Super excited to have you. Um, next, we have Courtney Christian with Pharma. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here with you all again. Um, I'm Courtney Christian. I'm a deputy vice president at Pharma in our policy and research department. Uh, I lead our equity initiative, which is um, an, uh, an initiative focused on three main pillars. The first is uh, improving clinical trial diversity, uh, advancing health equity, and then growing a more diverse talent pipeline into our industry. So I'm happy to be here with some of our member companies. Pharma represents over 30 of the world's leading biopharmaceutical companies. Um, in another life, I was like Cecilia on the Hill. Um, Capitol Hill staffer in healthcare was always part of my portfolio, but in 2010, my family experienced an extreme uh, health event. My dad had a heart transplant and my mom was being treated for brain cancer all at the same time. And so, you know, we were on the search for a medicine that would work for my mom. And then, you know, on the other side of transplantation, there are all these anti-rejection medicines that a patient has to take um, that you want to make sure that the medicine is right. And now I'm a mother of a seven-year-old who's back in the back on his iPad. Um, who has who was born with a congenital heart defect, and he was on blood pressure medicine from the age of four months to two years. And so it's very important to me that the medicines that our companies are creating uh, meet the patient at the right time um, and are the best medicine for them. And so we've galvanized a lot of support across our industries as a trade association uh, to work on clinical trial diversity. You'll hear me talk a little bit later about a major initiative we launched last year because it's super important that every medicine every that all of our companies make are the right fits for the for every patient that needs it. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your personal connection as well. And finally, we have Kendall Whitlock from Walgreens Foods Alliance. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really exciting to listen to fellow panelists who I've inspired from afar as we've been preparing for today. <laughs> I have been in the pharma industry also for about 25 years and joined the Walgreens Boots Alliance as the head of digital optimization in the new real world evidence clinical trials team at Walgreens. And you might scratch your head and think retail pharmacy in the clinical trial space? Well, our CEO, Roz Brewer, made a commitment in seeing the disproportionate hospitalizations and mortality in black and brown communities across this country. There are 9,000 plus Walgreens stores in the United States, and 78% of Americans are within five miles of a Walgreens store. So inspired by our CEO and our chief trials officer, Ramita Tandon, who made a commitment to do something differently than what we've seen in the pharma industry for decades. We know that clinical trial processes have not changed materially in decades, but we do know we can do better. For example, we have three service lines now to address clinical trials by meeting people where they are. And by meeting people where they are, we can talk about patient recruitment differently than we've done historically in the past. We don't have to limit ourselves to just email blasts in bolus numbers and have a 1% recruitment through the funnel. We've got to do things differently to educate communities about what a clinical trial is in the first place. Mm -hmm. People have learned about clinical trials more than they have prior to the pandemic in part because it was in our faces, on our news, on our televisions every single day for the last few years. Does that mean that people are suddenly gonna jump at the chance just because it's now more readily available? Well, it should certainly not be within two hours of where people live, because even if they are fully educated about what clinical trials are, it may not be convenient for them if they have a job nine to five like you and I do, and that may not be the time for them to participate. So through what other modalities can patients learn about what a clinical trial is? identify the safety of clinical trials and who are trusted sources. Well, it's also imperative that we think about trustworthiness, not putting on the shoulders of people and communities whether or not they are trusting of sources, but whether or not we are worthy of their trust. Mm -hmm. The second service line after patient recruitment is at-home trials. We have to be more flexible and convenient for people. 
We cannot limit participation to the few sites that are in the few geographic areas, limited to the few people who do research. I know, by the way, for the last 20 years, there have not been materially increasing numbers of investigators in clinical trials. It's only about three to four percent of the population are clinical research investigators. So how are we training the next generation of people to participate as investigators in clinical trials? Similar to the physician shortage, we have a shortage of investigators in clinical research. Perhaps there are things we can do differently. The third service line in the Walgreens real world evidence clinical trial business is real world evidence. And it's the most exciting thing, Leo. I can't wait to talk mm -hmm. to you further after the panel discussion and I'll get into more of the detail. But patient recruitment, making trials available at home and real world evidence, we hope to impact the disproportionate underrepresentation of black and brown communities in clinical trials. I'm excited to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just excited for your answer. Um, I just want to take a second and really just highlight um, one of the things I'm really excited about about the reintroduction of um, Rep Kelly's bill is that really a lot of the points that Kendall underlined here are one of the, some of the things that we're asking people to grapple with with their conceptualization of clinical trials. Like you said, um, we need the COVID-19 pandemic has really taught us that there are different ways that we can approach. There are things that we have done traditionally outside the home that we now can do in the home. So really looking at ways to really eliminate some of the barriers that people are having to access trials. And like you said, really looking at the ways that we can really look at building trust as well, because we do know that that is a really important barrier that we have to help folks navigate. So with that in mind, I would just like to pose this question to the panel. I wonder if you all would speak a little bit to some of the challenges that you've faced in trying to move forward in diversifying clinical trials. And anybody can start. Well, I think um, we're partnering with sites and who are doing very well, sites in Tennessee, Alabama, California, San Antonio, Texas, the Bronx, and they're close to communities of color and do very well enrolling communities of color. And they're enrolling on average about 30% of their patients are either black, Latino, or from other uh, countries. And they're teaching us best practices. Big challenge is cultural humility. Mm -hmm. So um, they've asked us to do three things, which is, create, co-create education with them on unconscious bias, uh, referring physicians or referring patients too late and they're not qualifying for trials. So really helping the community understand the importance of inclusive research and conscious bias that's existing in your healthcare system. So how can we exact change? And then patients, um, there's a fear, right? The patient doesn't wanna be treated like a guinea pig, doesn't want a placebo. So how are we bringing education in to talk about how we're taking care of patients in our clinical trials? getting the top diagnostics, the top medical care, and being seen more frequently in our trials so that we can make changes more quickly. So I, I think there's a trust building that's mm -hmm. extremely important. Uh, big bad pharma, right? Mm -hmm. uh, prices of our drugs and what are we doing right and how can we better help patients? So working with patient advocacy communities. Uh, but there's, there's a real sense that you need to be doing, like you said, move from talking about it to doing. Mm -hmm. So everybody must do something. We've got some partners in the back and there. It's helping people focus and be intentional. So five things we can do now in every study team and mandating diversity plans in our phase two and three trials. So we're talking very early about reaching patient populations, but we have a lot of work to do. We have to invest people and resources. And uh, to your point, look at data, epidemiology and set goals, um, but really going to where the patients are too. Can I double click a little bit on the issue of trust that both of you are talking about? Because when we started uh, the equity initiative at Pharma, we started with all these focus groups. We are a trade association, so we're not running trials um, just like, uh, like our member companies are, but we are trying to make those linkages and those connections across our industry to make sure all of our companies are making sure that it's a business imperative. Like Leo said, there's a real business imperative here. But the issue of trust is one that just is bubbling, 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 bubbling. And I remember when we first started um, thinking about what our equity initiative would look like, we did just a number of focus groups. We talked to different um, races, different ethnicities, different folks of sexual orientation. What do you want to see from the pharma industry in terms of clinical trial diversity? And one thing that has stuck with me and probably stuck through all of our work and when I talked to all of our board members, um, one, one gentleman said, are you coming to help or are you coming to harm? Mm. And that really jolted me and jarred me. And so I think that's how we've approached um, as a trade association, our work on clinical trial uh, diversity. Are we coming to help or are we coming to harm? 
And so to that end, um, the last few years, we updated our clinical trial diversity principles to really uh, double click on the issue of past wrongs that people are talking about every day. COVID-19, I think, really brought that to the fore. Do I take this vaccine or not? I had friends calling me like, I know you work at pharma <laughs> and uh, comma, am I supposed to take this vaccine? Um, and, you know, as a person of color, full, you know, full disclosure, I had to say yes, um, because I knew the science behind it was strong, but I had my own internal biases about do I trust this industry that I work in? And so um, those are very honest conversations that we had to have with ourselves and with our stakeholders about uh, participation in clinical trials. We are coming to help. We are not coming to harm. And this is how we're coming to do it. We're coming to you to ask you for the solution. We're not airdropping in and saying, we've got a ready-made solution for you and you just plug and play and do it. But what every community is unique. Every community has unique needs. What are the unique needs of your community so that we can can work with you to make sure that the company that has a trial for um, a condition that's disproportionately impacting your community is able to come and talk with you, build that trust on the ground to say, we are coming to help and not to harm. We're making a medicine that we wanna make sure has efficacy for you and your family and your community. How can we help you do that? How can we partner within that with you? I'm just gonna add the building, building trust, and I like the way Kendall said it, earning trust mm -hmm. also. It's essential to every piece of clinical trial diversity of why it matters and why it's valuable. It's essential to the business case because when I get questions within Pfizer about why, you know, why is Pfizer involved with clinical trial diversity? Where's, what's important there? And we, we talk about it as, look, there's a problem because there's people that are, we have medicines that work. These are made of medicines that treat, treat diseases, but some people or a lot of people aren't getting them. There's a barrier. There's a barrier to our products. And so, it's not probably, it, it, it probably shouldn't be the number one reason, but that's a reason that it's sustained to say like clinical trial diversity is, it, is essential and it's trust is right in there because if you don't have that, we've seen from research that if patients don't trust the results or trust the testing of the medicine, they don't want to take, they don't want to try it, they don't want to take it, they don't want to stay adhering to it. Mm -hmm. I want to pick up on this. Um, there was an article by Stallings et al. and I would encourage all of you to, to look for it. And it was the validation of the perceptions of research trustworthiness scale. And they compared in an aggregate across African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asian uh, responders to this work, what their perceptions were of research trustworthiness. And I think there were 18 items total. But one of the things I found striking was that African-Americans compared to Caucasian responders had varying levels of reasons for mistrust or distrust. So on this topic of trust, one takeaway from today is that trust is not one thing. And Asian population compared to Caucasian population had different parameters that they accounted for on the level of trust or mistrust or mistrust and distrust. So we can't think about diversity in clinical trials as the goal. Diversity in clinical trials, yes, is the result, but who were we upstream? Who are we upstream? When I think about the commitment that Walgreens has made in transforming a retail pharmacy to becoming a healthcare company, we have strategic partnerships to go upstream in who we are becoming in order to get to that result across the board. So if we think about going upstream, we think about the relationships. We now have Village MD. Village MD is a network of primary Mary care doctors, because we know if your own doctor does not do research, chances are you will not get the invitation to participate in a clinical trial from your own doctor. So where else might you go and who else might you be communicating with that you trust so that the information shared with them is something that you can action? Another relationship, well, Village now picked up Summit Health and Summit Health expands that primary care network. Well, again, Senior citizens, take as an example, older adults, excuse me. Older adults will say, well, I would like to take that shot in the example of COVID-19, but I can't get there. Okay, we've got something for that. We now have care centrics that enables at-home care. We can send care to people when care cannot be provided. So we've got to think about who we are upstream of the results that we are trying to achieve. And if people have issues with trust, where they can go for education, who is engaging them? Because specifically to your question, 
Why are we here? How did we get here? Why is there underrepresentation of diverse participants in clinical trials? Is perhaps because the people who wanted to do and set up businesses in clinical trials do not have the most diverse populations geographically where they're located. That's just common sense to then think about where else a clinical trial can go. So let's start with the low hanging fruit. Like what is obvious to us? What are the first one, two, three things we can do coming out of this room? I don't mean like in our businesses. I mean, coming out of this room, what can you do? What can I do? What are you doing? What have, hasn't been done? Like those kinds of questions, real talk. All right, I'll stop. Conclusion. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm sure the room appreciates your fire and your passion. Can I bust a myth real quick too? Sure. Just in addition to trust, mm -hmm. protocol complexity and burden. Mm -hmm. um, Ken Gatz and Tufts University has debunked this myth around placebo. Only about 15% of clinical trials have a pure placebo in a, in a trial. Most of the time you cannot get a drug out if it's not as good as, better or more convenient or safer than the drug that's already there. It's always comparing to a standard of care. And I want to bring that in because it's part of trust. It's like, you're going to, I'm going to get in a trial and you're going to give me nothing aside from medical care and, and diagnostics. But there, there is a standard of care in clinical trials. And that's a, that's a part of understanding and building understanding of what's available. But that complexity is a real problem because it'll keep us out of Walgreens. And I want to be in Walgreens. <laughs> but Altus has also said that as we're trying to get faster to market, we're squishing the trials instead of a phase one, two, three, four. There's a phase two, three, four. And it's doubling up in procedures and it's crippling sites and patients who work nine to five can't get there can't be a part of those trials because they're not after hours so thank you walgreens because you're going to bring right. that too I, um, but the home health yeah. and the virtual those those are barriers having these mini in-person visits so just there's um patients can really help us with this patients come in and tell us you're not going to get urine from me every hour when i'm in a wheelchair mm -hmm. you're not going to get anything else if you do that so right. bringing patient insights also helps us build cultural humility and understanding about what they're facing so just as a another big challenge is listening to your external sites and patients to make sure you're bringing that input in i just wanted to bring us back um i want to ask this question explicitly because i think the panelists have pretty much touched on it and leo I'd like to start with you. Um, how would you say that the lack of clinical trial diversity and health inequity are related? Uh, they're, they're related because it's really the start. It's a start of where, first of all, there's benefits to being in a clinical trial. So already right then, the quality of, the, the, the quality of care that a person has, if, they are, if, it's, if they're not able to participate in a clinical trial or it's too hard, is low. But then also what it does is, it le as we know, it, and there's there's been studies that show this. Then, once the once the um, medicine is on the market, if there's not trust, again, trust within how it was tested and developed, and if you don't see yourself in the trial, you're less likely to want to use it. Mm -hmm. And even even probably just as important is there's unknowns about it. Very being very frank about it, there may be unknowns about how how you're going to respond to a medicine if you weren't part of the trial. And so, that starts to perpetuate. It's really or exacerbate the disease disparities. They're there already, and so then what? Just going from there, I think it's. I think it could be a larger thing. It just kind of also the the mistrust within the medical um, infrastructure itself. So I think a big piece is if there's one piece that there's there's distrust and you don't and it makes you less likely to want to participate. It just it permeates over all of your health behaviors. I'm going to pick up on uh, Ken. Get the the example of Ken Getz and just to say that in a survey some years ago, um, that group did an analysis of patient perspective about clinical trial participation and found 96% of people would participate in a clinical trial if they heard about it even through their retail pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Why? Because people are refilling a prescription more frequently than they're seeing a doctor. That's common sense that people are aware, educated, engaged regularly, it seems likely that they would then say, okay, what next? Especially if they understand the potential value of participation, access to care. Um, a lot of people during the pandemic lost their jobs. You lose your job, you lose your health insurance, you lose your health insurance, the control over whatever you are managing or your family may be managing diminishes. So we have to think about things holistically in this ecosystem and thinking about clinical trials as a, or clinical research as a care option. So that acronym K CRACO is another takeaway that if you don't know that acronym, clinical research as a care option, something to contemplate, maybe not appropriate for every single disease and every single type of trial, but certainly something to keep in mind as we are developing what are the foundational pieces of education that we can start to share in our communities. Right for refusal, right? <laughs> right. That Absolutely. should always be offered. Always. You can say no, mm -hmm. but you should know what your options right. are. Always. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
I want to ask a two-part question, right? Um, we know that the FDA is looking at having companies um, really publicize or create these uh, clinical trial diversity plans before they go over. And again, that is one of the parts that um, Rep. Kelly's legislation is wants to push forward to make sure that we're thinking about those things on the ground floor. Right. And we talked a little bit about barriers, but I also want us to highlight some, some, some successes. So I wonder if you could speak to um, what um, what you all, how you all are preparing to implement um, clinical diversity plans and also some successes you've had in terms of moving in that direction. I don't mind starting. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, Walgreens is the second largest retail pharmacy in the country. And that means that 190,000 or the million uh, people are filling their prescriptions at Walgreens. You match the pharmacy footprint of retail pharmacy data or pharmacy data specifically, not retail data, but pharmacy data and pharmacy patients to electronic medical records. Well, if you match pharmacy records to electronic medical records, you begin to see a holistic picture of the types of things where we can intervene together. And again, in the context well, of clinical well, trials, it's not just helicoptering in and deciding we're going to tell any person or community what we can do. This is about co-creation with communities, identifying perhaps through instruments like a community health needs assessment in seeing the holistic picture from pharmacy records and medical records. Maybe people at certain ages are missing screenings. If people are missing screenings, then how will they know what action to take around their health? If people are unaware of the opportunity to match to a clinical trial where it's warranted, where would they hear that information if it doesn't come from the person that they trust their, and their primary care doctor? There are many different strategies, but marrying pharmacy record to the electronic medical record allows us to take a cohort of patients for a sponsor and identify within 30 minutes how many eligible participants are in the Walgreens data set for their clinical trial. Let me repeat that because it's worth repeating. The millions of patients in the pharmacy record is one piece of information about patients. The medical record is another piece of information about patients. Stitching that together cuts down the time that sponsors have to take to identify the number of eligible patients. Well, having a bolus number of people, that's great to have a number, but what do the people know? What are the other determinants of health? If we know that the RCT, randomized double-blind placebo, controlled trial data only gives us about of the information about people is made up of social determinants of health then how are we learning what those social determinants of health are then where can we intervene where do people want to work with us where are we invited we can't just decide on our own that we want to do this or do that we have to pay attention to what people are educating us about mm -hmm. and in educating us we then prioritize our strategy i'll stop because there's so many speakers who have things to Thank say you so much. Um, I'm just going to first. I was going to say I'm very happy to see that the environment around data linkage and tokenization is, has gotten a lot more robust at ease because people are starting to see how we can use that. There used to be a lot of well, there still is a lot of privacy concerns, but I think now we're getting we are getting better at saying this is why we need this data linked together. It's not just buying you to watch you; it's to be able to really help you more. I, as far as the things that are we're doing for um, FDA diversity plans, it's looking for better data. So in my group, we, we developed a, a framework and we've, we've just got to publish and say, look, this is how we're going to set goals. We're going to be transparent about it because the FDA made it very clear that part of their um, action plan, and it's, it's only the beginning to say, look, our trial needs to look like this. How do we determine that? That's just the start. Then it's about how do you keep your patients in the trial all the way through. But since we know that they're going to ask us and they're going to say, look, you've got goals and you have to show us how you've done this. And we've submitted some action plans we're actively looking for better data sources. We're actually part, and we're actually making sure we're really um, active in helping get those data sources to be better. So we're involved mm -hmm. with the, um, the FDA Reagan Udall Foundation to say, what can we do? How can we get this, this data, race and ethnicity data specifically to be better? Uh, we made sure we took great interest in OMB's proposal for better standards. Mm -hmm. So it's just, look, we're constantly looking to see what's a better data source. And I think to Kendall's point, a lot of it is, it's linked data because in especially in our healthcare system or in our lives, our, our imprints are all over the place and it needs to be linked. A real world data issue. transparency. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think this issue of data kind of goes back to your previous question about the linkage between uh, clinical trial diversity and health equity. Mm -hmm. Because if you're collecting real world data um, and you're analyzing it, uh, constantly analyzing at the same time, you're figuring out where the gaps are, you're figuring out where the needs are, you're figuring out where those other social uh, determinants of health are. 
um, and being able to kind of formalize a plan to figure out, okay, who do I partner with? Who are the trusted community um, leaders that I need to partner with? Who are the state agencies that I need to partner with? The Department of Health that I need to partner with? Um, to be able to harness that data in a way that um, gives some feedback into the to the medicine development part, um, process. And then you know you're making a medicine that's gonna reach the right person at the right time, that's gonna have some efficacy for them, but then it'll also have that sort of upstream effect of bridging some of those so some of those health equity gaps that we see, and then when you have people being adherent to medicine, then you've got the domino effect of people going to work. There's not lost pro productivity. There's that that ROI for businesses of being sure that you know their patients are healthy and have access to the medicines that they need. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's not just one, something that's just um, I think just for the healthcare sector to think about. And we're very specific as people as one part of the healthcare community as part of pharma, but it's really something for everybody to be thinking about. Um, wherever you sit in your community, um, this issue of clinical trial diversity being really attached to closing uh, disparities. I, uh, I echo the real world data, and I know we're using AI to better understand disease and how to reach our patients. I will have a watch out. Who are the people, people who are not in the system? Who's not getting the prescription? Who's not getting it filled? who, um, because of insurance, a physician feels they have to put an ICD-9, a diagnosis code down, that will get insurance reimbursement, but it may not actually be the disease they have. So there is a watch out with records. Um, I will say, since we're giving actions to the audience, I'm part of a registry trial. I'm a twice melanoma survivor. I'm in registries. I believe in the work we do. The biosample repositories, the, the cells that our researchers are working in the labs to find new discoveries, new targets, new medicines, 90% are from patients of European ancestry. So we have to have those cells, those blood samples, urine, saliva, tumor tissues need to be heterogeneous. We need Asian, African American, Native American. We need all ancestries. I have a geneticist in the back. She will tell us all about that. I think if you could do one thing, it's encouraging people to sign up for registries. If they unfortunately do have something they're suffering from, how can they be a part? These are non-interventional trials. So if we want our real world data to help all our real world patients, we have to figure out a way to build that trust and invite folks in, make sure we're de-anonymizing everything so we can find these new targets. And that's part of our health equity population science group of, of how are we in personalized healthcare how are we making sure we're identifying those unique ancestry markers across different patient populations? So a, a little bit of a watch out. I'll send my tech nerds in the back, hand out to you. Um, they know the gaps. Uh, I love virtual data, but not everybody has broadband access. Mm -hmm. So how are we doing that for our rural populations, for our underserved populations? You, you saw COVID. We had kids out front of McDonald's getting internet access to get educated. This is a real issue. So as we move into virtual health, which is good, I'm, I'm with it. I'm really with it. We have to, to help decentralize trials. We need to make sure everybody has access and capability and ability to be able to access things through. Maybe it's di diversifying how we reach people. I love that you yeah. just brought up the digital divide because of the 29 million Americans that don't have broadband access. That is the third pillar of our strategy for digital optimization. You have to think about it realistically. If the parent who has a finite number of minutes on a phone is giving that child their phone to do their homework, that parent is not thinking about a clinical trial. And nothing we can say is going to educate that person to say, let me choose this over that. They're going to choose to ensure that their children have what they need before themselves. So I think that building digital fluency and what's relevant about the use of digital technologies, everything has context. We can't think about these things in a vacuum. We can't think about the fact that if one doesn't have it, we then start to blame and say, oh, they don't know how to use it. Well, if somebody doesn't have a computer in their home or a thousand dollar smartphone in their purse, what, why would they be proficient in the use of the technologies and tools? I have so one. I we, still have problems with it. Yeah, so. I mean, <laughs> we know even older adults will say if you put it in front of them and instruct people how to use it, they will use it to the same extent as others. Mm -hmm. So we can't blame and judge. And we have a lot of that, I think, in this ecosystem.
as you all can see, our <laughs> panel is full of passion and knowledge. They have rich knowledge to share with us. And so I would definitely like to invite anyone in the room that has a question to step to the mic so we can make sure that you have an opportunity to, to ask some questions of the panel. Are we out of time already? We are. We are. Yeah. It's time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Hi. Hi. It's Hi, so good to see some folks I know up on the panel. My name is Camille Pope and I work with Acclinate. We have an opportunity to partner with many companies on um, creating diversity plans at this point and then also helping them to implement them, especially when it comes to the community engagement perspective. Um, and one of the things that I am observing as we're starting to, as we collaborate with different companies from the smallest to the largest is that there's not a lot of sharing of best practices, what has worked, what hasn't worked. Um, and I, I worked in traditional pharma for a long time, so I know that naturally can be a very competitive space when you're thinking about, you know, bringing drugs to market. But I firmly believe that we should not be competitive when it, we're talking about diversifying clinical trials and bringing clinical research to everyone. So, uh, you know, maybe this is a, a question for Courtney because she's with pharma, but like, how are we bringing companies together so that they are able to share best practices around this topic in a way where it's not so competitive and we're all learning from each other and we're all implementing things that are going to work and that are not going to work in the same way vein um, and then also at not just in rooms like this or at the highest levels but also so that that information is getting filtered down to like your day-to-day -day clinical operations people so they know like well this worked at Pfizer but it might not work at Janet right like how how are we how are we doing that as an industry yeah so to pull the curtain back there a little bit um thank you for the question um in the last year or so, we launched a big initiative. We funded um, a $2 million initiative, um, Equitable Breakthroughs in Medicine Development. And what we're really trying to do here is uh, go into communities and meet communities where they are. So instead of, you know, we've had a history, I think Kendall alluded to it a little bit of like setting up shop and, and then leaving. What we're looking to do is setting up shop and staying. So what does it mean if we build a, a, a medical home within the community, if there's a doctor there who knows that there's a, a trial going on and is able to um, inform their patients of their trial, um, if there are principal investigators that look like them, how do we mentor the next generation of principal investigators? So we're looking to do that within this program. How do we build the pipeline so that folks who want to participate in a trial, see people who look like them and feel a little bit more inclined to participate, ask questions, want to be involved. Um, and we did this really with the work of all of our companies. Our, our board of directors just really leaned in and said, what can we do as an industry? And so we have a clinical trial diversity workshop, uh, work group that meets a couple of times a month. Um, and we really sit and talk about what it is that we want to get out of this. What are the best practices that we're looking for? Um, you know, we have, I hear a lawyer in my head, uh, no antitrust, um, <laughs> sharing company secrets, but we do really talk about what is it we want from this? What are the best practices we're looking to get from this? So we partnered with Yale uh, School of Medicine, with Morehouse School of Medicine, with RM RCMI and Vanderbilt School of Medicine to uh, put together this community-based uh, infrastructure. It's a learning phase of the next 18 months. It has uh, officially launched uh, the learning phase part because we have a site uh, identified in uh, Southwest uh, in Georgia, um, but we're looking to build some sites in Texas as well. And we're really gonna be scaling up to 10 sites from very naive sites to mature sites to see what are the best practices um, across these sites. Um, having our companies come in and place trials there, where, wherever they are and, and within the phases to see um, what is needed? What kind of materials are needed? What are there community ambassadors that need, are needed? Uh, do we need digital health tools um, to teach people about what a clinical trial is or teach them about the different phases of a trial? Um, do we need to teach them about what an IRB is? There are a lot of protections now around clinical trials. And so we're really trying to build that sort of um, community and network and then seeing at the end of 18 months what works, what could be scaled up, what could be replicated how do we um, continue this? Because it's not just an 18 month, you know, um, activity for us. It's a lifelong um, issue for our, for our industry. If I can add just briefly, publish, publish, publish. 
So one of my uh, colleague, much, much uh, more experienced and seasoned and brighter than me, Shali Mohan has been leading a lot of work in our company around reaching black and brown communities. And she was part of a trial during COVID that reached over 380 patients in less than a month by working directly with sites to write the entry criteria that would enroll their patients who had pneumonia at the hospital with COVID. So it's partnering with sites to make sure entry criteria is not too stringent that the very patients we're trying to serve can't get into the trial. So I mean, publishing is very important um, and that close, close connection. But I would love a third day at NMQF for a coalition to share best practices in clinical yeah. trials. Mm -hmm. I think I, I'm there, I bet you all of us are. So uh, anywhere you give us a forum, bring us. And I agree, it's not a competitive space at all. This is a space we all need to be focused on. I think what we need Thank is you. we need government or FDA to kind of spearhead some round tables and workshops because then, when you, in my experience, then when companies get together, you don't have to guess what's gonna, why, what's gonna be um, required or what, what, what can we be doing. But I, and when I like, and there's been some sharing, and at least in my world, of best practices. But I like is if we got it more formal, then we could tackle big issues together. We could do something. We can get together and put some infrastructure in place. And one final thing, and I see other questions. I think um, even inspired by the White House emergency preparedness roundtable that happened earlier this year, and even the existence of that roundtable discussion with Rob Califf and other experts who discussed what happens if we have another pandemic, how are we prepared on the topic specifically of clinical trial participation? How are we prepared? So I had several dreams before coming to Walgreens. I spent the last 13 years with my former employer. And so this is not a proprietary uh, point, but it's a dream. And the dream is if we in our communities have the EMS services, the emergency medical services, and they provide CPR training, why can't we provide clinical trial training through that same mechanism? Now that's my dream, but others in the community may have their own dreams. And if we can figure out where we're dreaming and where we see gaps in our own communities and what problems we can solve in our own communities, then I think that we can find other people. The way I found Walgreens was somebody heard me on my soapbox and said, you know, there's this woman who's always talking about the same things you're always talking about. We met, that is now my boss. I'm just saying, we can dream together and we can take action. We don't have to wait for anyone to tell us to take action. Thanks, Sean. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. And morning. thank you so much to the panelists. Um, my name is Anne Noel. I currently work as an evaluator. Um, my question to you all, um, I have a background in community, sorry, in CBPR, which is community-based participatory research. And my question to you all is that, um, is CBPR approach is being used in clinical trials? If yes, how well is it working? Or if no, is, there, is this something that can be used in clinical trials in order to um, increase diversity in clinical trials. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I could take that I was gonna quickly. Say. Yeah. yeah. Or uh, we have innovation labs at Genentech where, and we have a patient co-creation council with over 180 patients who are representative and they can come in they helped us actually design the studio and they come in and give us insights for how to make our products better, but also design of our trials, what's burdensome. And we even have like, if you're not a big pharma and you're small biotech, um, you can bring a patient and a coordinator in before you finalize your protocol, walk them through a screening visit. And I've had an ALS patient, N of one, change our secondary endpoint, time to wheelchair. And she's the one who said, you're not gonna get urine from me every hour and get everything else. And um, there were some ocular exams in this, this visit scenario too. And she said, you know, I can't get out of my wheelchair and get into all that equipment. You're gonna have to change all that equipment for anybody who comes in a wheelchair. So, it's uh, the power of the patient story to help people stop and think about what they're doing and become more human. Everybody wants the perfect trial. And they pile everything onto it because they're worried they're gonna miss something important, safety or data. But you really need um, those insights from people to be a little realistic about what you're asking your patients to do. That's one example. And we have partners in patient advocacy in the back table that can talk to more where we're working directly with advocacy we have patient advocacy councils, our global patient partnership has over 15, and, and there's uh, site relationships as well. But, and we do believe in embedding DNI wherever we are. So the first thing we did in the CDO office was find representative talent on our scientific committee, the Gentech board. 
So um, bring representation everywhere. I was going to give a very similar example, so there's no reason in being redundant, but to say, yes, we do use it. I just uh, brought in a senior manager, Ebony Scott, who has a talent in CBPR, and this is going to be integrated into our plans going forward, too. So no reason in duplicating the comment. But thanks for the question. Thank you. Hello. Um, Thank you so much for the panelists. My name is Abigail Graham. I'm a senior nursing student at Coppin State University. And I believe that this question was touched on, but just requesting further clarification. How can we as we're senior nursing students and we want to be able to impact as many people in the Baltimore DC area as possible, especially since they are vulnerable populations. And I know that Ms. Kendall touched on that the best way is for providers to actually be involved in clinical trials so that way we were able to relay that information to our patients. My question is, how, what does that pathway look like from being a new grad all the way up until being involved in a clinical trial so that we were able to actually improve access to medicine and healthcare? I'm glad to take this and start. Um, so thank you so much for the question. It's a pleasure to meet you and hear your question specifically. Um, I wear many hats um, in addition to my role in uh, Walgreens. One of them is the subcommittee chair in product development and clinical research for the MedTech Color Collaborative Community. And you may remember that FDA set about to establish collaborative communities in different areas. So this is one of several collaborative communities. But just specifically because it came in my inbox on Friday, um, MedTech Color is hosting a Juneteenth event in this in the Baltimore area, um, as well as other locations. So thinking about just structurally, where are people talking about this topic? So again, it's sometimes at a conference where people may not have registration fees to enter the conference. So how many people do we see from communities in our conferences because they're expensive to enter into. We also know that boots on the ground, universities, acad other academic partners, those investigators and, and staff do research for multiple types of organizations. It could be with com community groups, patient groups, pharma. It can be multidisciplinary. The point is, starting with the topic, the subject, the area of interest that you have, and then being able to establish and build from there Connection to people. The first thing we said when we met was we've got to stay connected. Um, this is a community that we've been in for a long time. I'm sure the stakeholders in this room have been connected to peers on the subject. And so identifying where are people connecting? How are they connecting? Um, I've been approached to do publications on this topic by people I don't professionally work with, but that just knew what I was interested in and invited me for the opportunity to start to publish. So we've got to think about things almost in a non-traditional sense. Um, and this is going to sound hokey, but as the chief love officer in my family, I'm always looking for solutions. So if you are somebody who does anything where you are also trying to solve problems, I'm down with you. And I'm trying to figure out and connect you to sources where you may be able to partner, whether it's in a local geographic area like a Baltimore um, or anywhere um, digitally as well. I would uh, just answer that question, mm -hmm. just a follow on. Pharma has hosted the last couple of years a graduate summit where we're bringing together students from diverse uh, backgrounds. So as I like to say, finding the next CFOs, right, right. the next research labs, the next people to sit in the nerd department, as I love when we call our pharmacy and research shop. Um, but we've also created a community there. So those students are new in career. Some are different parts of their career, um, different points of their career, but they've created a community. And then we've also taken that community to LinkedIn so that they stay in touch on LinkedIn um, and our companies can go to that LinkedIn page to find those, those students and to find that community. And I just heard a stat the other day, um, we were in a meeting and 9% um, of the folks that have uh, attended our last couple of graduate summits have found placement within our companies. So it's a great way to figure out, to find community, to find other people who are talking about clinical trial diversity or other parts of uh, the industry as well. So I would encourage you to to join the summit. There is another one coming up in September. Thank you. First of all, thank you, sorry. Frontline nurses and educators, thank you. You're educating our children. You're keeping us safe. Um, there's this, as uh, you've all heard of it, this great resignation right now in our medical industry. And my ask of you is that you, you educate other nurses. 
So um, you obviously are here, you understand representation. I have two nurses in my family, they're young, neither got vaccinated. So I wonder what percentage of their patients didn't get vaccinated. Um, there's this huge disparity in believing science or not believing science. So how are we communicating about science in a way that makes sense to our populations? Um, I'm thankful that one nurse is now, she's, she decided to go into the NICU and is mandated to have a vaccine. Um, and these are good people, but misguided. Um, Google, nothing about Google. You search in some areas of the country, COVID is, and you get fake or killing people. So there's this huge divide and nurses are our front lines. They're the most trusted profession in the medical uh, profession. So thank you for, for doing this and also just educating others around you to be able to talk about clinical trials. It'd be huge. I was just going to add recasting or maybe emphasizing more that healthcare providers, nurses, that they are role models. And that, look, what you do, people are watching what you do. They're taking your lead. And that can be really powerful. So is that, that that's part of the education to say, look, what you know what, practice what you preach. And you can influence, you can, you can influence public health just by your own practices and what you say. I love that. I was interviewing um, a Latino professional. And he said as soon as he could, his whole family went into a COVID trial. Right. And he, he was interviewed about it. He said, I want my kids to be vaccinated. You have a physician who's doing that. So I agree, role models, extremely important. We have one more question. Yes. Hi, my name is Renika Alexander Parrish, and I am from Pfizer. I'm the US Medical Director for Health Equity for Vaccines and Antivirals. Started my career as a nurse, so shout out to that nurse, the most trusted of the healthcare professions. One of the things that we, thank you. And one of the questions I wanted to ask of the panel is, is well, I'll start with a statement that there, need, there needs to be the right people at the table to ask the right question, to know the industry, to be able to understand what the needs are of the industry, and then be able to translate back to those communities that we're trying to reach. And so one of the ways that we do that is through our talent management. And I want to just ask, of course, Leo is my colleague, so he knows what's going on. But, um, and I can also share some things as well. But I wanted to ask the folks on the panel, what are you doing as far as talent um, development and bringing folks to the table at the space, not where they're actually at the execution uh, portion of the work, but they're some of the decision makers. They're there when the concept is developed all the way to the end to dissemination and not just dissemination, a two way discussion. Um, so what is happening in talent management across our colleagues? Because I'm, I'm looking forward to taking some of that back and implement. Our, our first act in the CDO was to find representation for our steering committee. This is the committee that it's not just on one trial, one program, it's all of our science. And we have Dr. Carpenter who identifies as Black or African American on that steering committee. But our diversity and workforce is a huge endeavor and we've developed development programs specifically for Black and Latino employees as well as for Asian employees um, and host to them with mentors in, in, in the broader company as well. We've changed our talent funnel. So it's not just our local folks we're bringing in from UCSF and UC Berkeley and Stanford. We're working with HBCUs. We have fellowships with Howard. We're, we businesses, DNI is in our business. We are, we're bringing in everywhere. Um, and our vendors, we're holding them accountable. We're asking them to bring representation to the table. Our patient co-creation council, we're asking for black and Latino patients. So we're, we're trying, everywhere we are, we're trying to bring representation. We know diversity of thought has diversity of innovation, Diversity of staff in our workforce means diversity in enrollment. So this is this is uh, research evidence. So we're we're everywhere we are, we're trying to bring representation. Walgreens similarly has um, an interest in diversifying talent. So I can speak only to the clinical trials business, but I can say if Alethea Jackson, our uh, senior executive vice president or chief diversity officer and EVP of ESG, uh, Environment, Sustainability, and Governance. Love her. Um, if she were here, she would be able to speak more broadly to the Walgreens organization. But in the clinical trials business, diversity of staff. So I'm one of seven heads of within the clinical trials business. So digital optimization, study conduct, decentralized trials, product, and real world evidence, et cetera. There's also commercial lead. Each one of those teams is a diverse team intentionally. So if we think about study conduct, uh, Adam Sampson's team is representative of multiple types of diversity, in part because patients in the community, as he's running out, running trials through communities, they want to see concordance with who the research professionals are who are participating in the recruitment effort. 
So it's not just one type of professional or one type of diversity, but diversity across all roles and all ranks. Um, but Olivia can probably speak more holistically to the organization. And the so I wanna make sure that we stay on time. Because, Thank you. Um, and so, I, but I wanna uh, make sure that I give the uh, panelists an opportunity to offer some closing thoughts. One thing that I really want to pinpoint here is that our panelists at various times in our conversation here have really underscored the importance of involving a community, right? To build trust, to make sure that we're able to design tri trials that meet their needs. And I'd also like to underscore again, that is one of um, the tenets of the bill that Rep Kelly will be moving for for the clinical trial diversity bill. But I'll, I'll start with you, Megan. Any closing thoughts? Yeah, I think maintain the momentum, right? This, we didn't get here overnight, it's not turnkey. And I'm quoting Dr. Monica Baskin at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and I asked her, how are we gonna keep the engagement and energy after COVID for increasing representation? She's like, maintain the momentum. And uh, the other is find, find a buddy, uh, to your point, it's gonna take all of us, but also a, a group of committed champions can really change healthcare. Um, those two nurses could come together and I bet they could create a nursing education program. So. Find another uh, soulmate in the audience today. Get linked in with everybody. And please talk about clinical research at the kitchen table. Um, we have to kind of bridge this divide in anti-science and science and talk about how science is saving lives. I'll just say keep the focus on building trust, earning trust, maintaining trust, because I won't get the saying right, but you know, it takes a long time to build trust. It just takes one thing to lose trust. And so I just think it's essential to everybody's success, our success, that we um, that clinical trials are made more diverse. And I think also what it can do is really, it, it's something that we have to make sure it sustains itself as well. And so transparency, I like a lot of what I've seen in legislations about just how much trials are gonna have to report, who was in their trial, how did they do, what were their goals, how did they set these, where are we doing? So transparency builds a lot of the trust in, in a really fundamental way. I'd like to leave you with a quote by one of my um, one of my mentors who, I'm, who I love and probably who all of you know, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall. Um, but one quote that she said to me, and I've got it on a sticky pad in several places in my house and in my office at work, is that uh, health is a crown worn by those who are well and seen only by the sick. And so I, that sticks with me as we do this work. Um, what are we doing to bring um, medicines to those who are sick so that they can be well? So they can live the type of lives, they can be the moms, the dads, the wives, the, sisters, the brothers, the cousins that they want to be. Um, they can show up in their workplaces the way in the in the ways in which they want to show up. Um, and so I just want to make sure that as pharma, we are continuing to be a North Star for our member companies in thinking about how we do um, build and earn trust among communities to participate in trials, to do the education that is needed but to also make sure that we are coming to help and not to harm. We want to make sure people are well and not sick. There are so many things I'd like to say, but I will be brief. <laughs> um, Thomas Levis accounted for $230 billion in the cost of health disparity. 84,000 people is the number of people in excess, according to a book from Dr. David Satcher years ago. So if we think about health disparity, we have to think about bridging that gap. It costs us in our GDP. We talked, we heard Susan Rice yesterday talking about the billions of dollars that are lost on the table due to inequity. The jobs that are lost, the 6 million, 6.1 million jobs that we don't have because of these gaps. If we don't think about employment gaps, housing gaps, education gaps, it will be very difficult for us to address health disparities and health inequity. So I'd like to leave you with the possibility of our North Star, which how can you get more joy? How can you bring more joy through better health? Thinking about closing disparity gaps. Thank you so much to my panelists and thank you so much to you all for your time and attention. Thank you.